All right, we're ready to go. Hello, everyone. My name is Margaret Wallace. I'm an associate professor of the practice at Boston University's College of Communication. It's my pleasure to welcome you today to, to today's discussion, Keeping the Community in Broadcasting. Today's event is part of our series of virtual events we call Com Talks, featuring topics and experts in advertising, film, journalism, media science, public relations, and television. Our conversation today will be recorded and available to watch later online on the Com website and YouTube channel. Today's conversation will explore the history and future of community broadcasting. Big media dominates much of the conversation uh, around communication, but beyond the conglomerates and social media giants, community radio and television still serve local communities. These nonprofit, often volunteer powered outlets provide crucial information and tell stories ignored by others while providing learning opportunities for communicators early in their careers. We have assembled an expert panel to dig into all of this over the next hour. Let me take a moment to introduce you to them now. Peter Abzug is the producer and host of First Wave, broadcast on WPVM, a community radio station located in Asheville, North Carolina. Peter holds a bachelor's degree in journalism from Boston University and spent his career in corporate media relations. Welcome, Peter. Adam Boyaji is the station manager of BUTV and WTB, WTBU at Boston University. He received his master's in broadcast journalism from Com, and spent more than a decade in community media as the lead producer for BNN News, a partnership between the city of Boston and Boston University. Sally Kane is chief executive officer for the National Federation of Community Broadcasters. Founded 45 years ago, NFCB's services include national advocacy, industry thought leadership, customized station services, and field initiatives that help local media organizations navigate change and participate in transforming their service to communities. Payne has, ha has led NFCB for 10 years and has 25 years of experience working in community media. Moderating our discussion is Shannon Dooling, an associate professor of the practice in journalism at Boston University and an investigative reporter. Her work can be found on WBUR, Boston's NPR news station and nationally with ProPublica and NPR. Her reporting focuses primarily on immigration and criminal justice. Thank you everyone for attending today's event. And now I'll turn it over to Shannon. Thank you, Margaret. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us here online. Uh, many thanks to our esteemed panelists. Um, I'm gonna kind of steer the ship for the first 45 minutes or so and then uh, we'll open it up to questions for the group. So please keep that in mind. Um, you'll be able to uh, drop them into the Q&A tab um, around 3.45 or so. I'll give you a heads up. So we're going to try to get to as many of those questions as we can, but I'm going to dive right in. Um, Sally, I'd like to start with you, um, if we can. Uh, admittedly, I need a bit of an explainer about the differentiation between community broadcasting and sort of where I, the world I come from, which is public radio, public broadcasting. Can you give us sort of the basic breakdown of the main differences between those two uh, outlets? Yes, you're in luck. That's what I spent the last 10 years <laughs> doing. <laughs> so you. community radio is uh, a, a space within the public radio system. So it is public radio. It has the same listener support model for revenue. It's um, classified by the FCC, these stations with what we call NCE licensure, which is non-commercial and educational. 
And so in those ways, it's very similar. We're also beholden to the same body of laws around underwriting, um, how those are worded, what kinds of regulations the FCC has around all of that. And many community radio stations are uh, participate in the Corporation for Public Broadcasting's Community Service Grant Program, which people might be aware of. So in those ways, it's all part of public radio. Okay. Um, where where I where I find the distinction and where I think this is most understandable for people is that community radio stations typically have 65 or more percent of their programming created by volunteers, by people in the community or in the case of universities, students who come in and create that programming. Where a, tip, a typical NPR type station in public radio that you might be referring to, that's almost always paid professional staff. So think of it this way. These are like community development organizations that happen to do radio and not the reverse. Got it. Okay, that's a great uh, a great distinction. Um, based off of that, like let's take a, a step back um, even broader, I guess. What are some of the challenges that as community broadcasters, those outlets might face that differ from like like larger outlets, like an NPR, like a, like a WBUR, which is a member station of National Public Radio and has that paid employee model that community broadcasters don't necessarily have. How do the, the challenges facing those two models sort of vary? Yeah, so I think the primary theme of the challenges that varies a little bit are really based on a question of scale. So mm -hmm. to your point, these very small stations, and by that I mean um, they're, they're typically three to eight, 10 staffers, depending on the size. And a, a, a station with 10 people working there is a very big station in my world. Mm -hmm. uh, so there, there are the typical vagaries of um, so few people wearing so many hats. And you have right. someone who's taking the most minute detail in terms of the operation, all the way to being, in some cases, responsible for portions of a strategic planning process. So that creates quite a bit of stretch for people. Um, the other thing about it is that you have um, legions of volunteers, like thousands of volunteers across the country who do this. And on one hand, it's the greatest asset of community radio stations, gives it its spice and flavor and a whole lot of human power that is unpaid. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, it's its greatest Achilles heel because we all know that people can be <laughs> really difficult and it, it becomes hard to hold people to certain standards when they are volunteering, um, much harder than it is an employee where you say, this is how it needs to be done or else you're out of a job. Right. Um, and that doesn't happen in community radio. And then finally, just to be succinct about it all, I think that there is a major um, challenge in just the resource restraints of where these stations operate. So there are 200 member stations in our federation. 65% of those are serving rural areas in the country or um, minority communities or, and serving on Native American lands, right? So the model says you need more money, bring in more members. That works in an urban slash affluent city. That does not, that falls apart in these kinds of areas. So you have a service being provided with a, a major infrastructure tapped into a whole national network that is being provided on the backs of fewer people and people who make less money, generally speaking. And and I would assume that a lot of those areas, the latter that you just um, mentioned, are where community broadcasting is perhaps needed most, right? Where it's relied on most as a as a reliable source of information and cultural um, information. Yes, yeah. I can see that that being a difficult dynamic. Peter, I want to bring you in. I saw you sort of shaking your head there when Sally mentioned um, something about a sort of uh, resource drain. Um, uh, <laughs> Um, I'm imagining that you wear uh, plenty of hats uh, there in Asheville. Um, how do you how do you see, I guess, um, you know, your show on the community radio station uh, as being sort of community engaged? How do you build your audience? Well, first of all, everything Sally said was uh, right on the mark. I mean, she was describing uh, my experience so far with it. Um, 
I think, first of all, I am the host and producer of one particular show on this community radio station that has a vast amount of different types of shows, everything um, from local politics to uh, special places here um, in Asheville and in Western North Carolina. Um, I have um, started a series called, my my home show is called First Wave. Mm -hmm. My, what I'm starting is a series called Next Wave where I go to virtually unknown groups who play the club circuit here in Asheville. It's a very musical town for all types of genres. And I bring them in and we have a chat these type of things you will never ever hear in the large commercial stations and as far as wearing different hats and such you're you, you're correct i am sure i'm the host but i'm also the public re relations machine um i am i do the photo editing for social media i write um all the posts i write my own scripts i really have no one but myself that may sound like a negative but actually it's like being a given a blank canvas and say draw your picture and mm -hmm. i've often said to our station manager um wpvn is like this big market, covered market, where you have the vegetable stand and you have the fish stand and and so on. And, and I have my little stand and we can do within the parameters, as, as Sally said, we can do uh, what we think is best for the show. And um, it's it's just been an amazing experience. Tomorrow I have my first anniversary show 52 weekly shows done so oh congratulations that's quite thank you um Peter, one quick follow-up how do you involve the community when you're planning your programming or does the community sort of help to uh you know to inform your programming whether it's the musicality the guests the 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 topics etc yeah on um the way I'm not a new show, I'm strictly music, um, punk rock, classic, contemporary, new wave. Um, so a lot of what I play um, is not Asheville created, although there are instances where I do that. Mm -hmm. And um, so I involve the community in a sense by going to the local club, meeting, these different, I mean, there are just so many bands here, I don't, and artists here of all mm -hmm. types. And um, I try to get to know them. I invite them in. Mm -hmm. When I interview them, besides the usual questions, well, you know, what would you call your music and such? I ask them about the music scene here, what they see it as um, a place where they can be artists. Uh, I also asked them, what what does it take now to be noticed, you know, yeah. To, be, yeah. to get an audience? And those are conversations so, that you're right. You just don't hear on commercial radio, no. right? You just, you're, no. you, you're not going to hear those. Um, the space isn't there um, Correct. for the conversations. I want to I wanna bring Adam in, um, who has worked in Boston uh, community media for over a decade. Um, that's a good run, Adam. Um, what is it about community radio, community media that um, that you have an affinity for that draws you in, keeps you showing up? <laughs> yeah, thanks, Shannon. Um, I think I always really believed in kind of the dual mission that we were doing at BNN News. So just to kind of set the context, um, ours was a television show as opposed to radio. It was a half hour Monday through Friday. Um, 
And it was, as uh, we mentioned in the introduction, it was a partnership with the city of Boston and Boston University. So our studio was on the third floor of the communication school. And um, the mission, as I saw it, and what kept me coming back was one, to tell neighborhood-based stories that weren't being told in other places. Uh, and two, to be a training ground for young journalists. And I think um, those two things were sustaining enough for me to make it worthwhile to come in every day, to be excited to see my colleagues. Um, you know, we we just coming off election day yesterday. Uh, election season for us was a really exciting time. Um, you know, anyone that was running for city council would come through to our show. We did two to three uh, guest segments every day. So as elections ramped up, all the candidates would come through, incumbents and also first time candidates. Um, and I know Sally mentioned that one of the joys of community broadcasting is kind of the flavor and spice. And people may think, you know, Boston's a major market, uh, but the flavor and spice that you'd see in a city council election in terms of the range of candidates and the characters that come through uh, is still amazing to me, really. Um, but, you know, it was a true joy. We would talk about, you know, who's doing well in District 7, who, mm -hmm. who's maybe going to take out an incumbent for an at-large race. Yeah. Um, uh, so all that stuff really, to me, was made me a better journalist and um, was rewarding in a really sustaining way. Can you think of um, offhand a, a story that, uh, that BNN produced that, you know, you maybe wouldn't see um, on you know, Channel 5 or any of the other major market television um, programs here in Boston? Yeah, it's funny. I was kind of reflecting in preparation for this back on the stories we've done. And um, it meant a lot to me to be able to look back on on everything we've done. And I think one of the joys of community broadcasting is hopefully you land on a good team. I think every shop is different. Some shops are run better than others. And um, you know, the group that I had, my news director, Chris Lovett, and my videographer, Rich Rosenthal, we were the kind of the three only Sally mentioned like three to 10 people is 10 would be a big staff. We had three full time. The rest were students and volunteers. But I remember when I first started this. So this was probably 13 years ago now. Um, we featured the dedication of a house in the South End that was being named after uh, African-American artist named Alan Rohan Kreit, who passed away probably 20 years ago now. Um and um, I'm kind of biased to South End stories because that's where I've lived for the last 15 years. But um, it was just a really wonderful slice of life story about what he meant as an artist to that community. Um, we got bites from from neighborhood residents, but also sound bites from Byron Rushing, who was a state senator at the time. You know, and uh, Rohan Kreit used to just kind of sit in his windowsill in the 70s and 80s in the South End in Boston and paint neighborhood scenes, watercolors. Uh, and we sent a reporter there and we, we had examples of his artwork and, um, you know, pictures of the presentation as it was happening. And I think the audience hopefully got a real sense for what he meant to that particular neighborhood. Um, and and uh, so that was one story that stood out. Yeah. Yeah. That is a great example, I think, of when you can kind of go deep into a topic. Right. You don't you're not pulled into the sort of the same kind of um, commercial breaks and advertising um, kind right. of. Uh, reigns that you might be in a commercial station. Um, I'm going to open this up to any of you um, panelists. Um, when we're talking about um, sort of our information, how we receive information or um, the outlets that are available to us, or as my father would call it, infotainment, um, whether it's watching the nightly news or, or turning on the radio, um, you know, what's missing from from that commercial landscape that community broad that community broadcasters um, seek to sort of reinforce or to supply, like what can't you get from the commercial outlets that sort of what Adam was just talking about? But are there other kinds of examples, whether it's information, the way information is portrayed, or the way the community is engaged in a community broadcast scenario that you can't necessarily find in a commercial setting? Yeah, Sally, I'll jump in. Um... With regard to um, rural America and um, and communities of color, um, 
there is very little you can get from commercial media that's relevant to your lived experience. And I think that's a really important distinction to make. In media saturated environments, such as Boston, there may well be you know, plenty of local news around. There isn't where I live. There's one um, newspaper of record in the county. It comes out once a week. If there's a major news story, nobody's going to know about that. So these local community radio stations are a lifeline. Um, in the state of Alaska, there are a lot of community radio stations, both the geography and just the nature of, of how you live in Alaska means that radio is a literal lifeline for people for life-saving information that is not going to come through a commercial outlet because it's so specific in terms of weather patterns and things like that. Additionally, I want to make the point that increasingly weather-related phenomena are impacting our communities in very, very big ways. And you can't, you can't report on that accurately from, you know, 30,000 feet or to parachute in and cover the story. Those stories last for months and months and months. There are still people living on the outskirts of the, the town of Paradise in California in tents. And that was off of our 24-hour news cycle. Well, obviously within 24 hours. So it's the local media there that continues to carry those stories, but not just carry the stories. They have a lived experience of being survivors of that kind of an experience. And so they are also in the throes of things that, like navigating FEMA themselves. And so the stories are told, but they're told with deep lived experience. And I think that's something coming up in journalism in general is, you know, for a long time, we've, we've lived with the myth of um, objective reporting. Um, the, the, this is kind of changing the scene that way. Um, pe people have these lived experiences and um, we, what we view as bias can, can also, um, can maybe not be that, but maybe just be a different perspective. And I think younger generations are really seeing that in a big way that people of my age are, are, are slow to respond to. So that's one little basket of things I think yeah, I love that distinction. Peter, yeah, please. Do you have something to add? Um, yeah, I I really realized the power and the importance of community radio during um, not this election, election cycle, but uh, the one before this, where, of course, the station covered the congressional race, um, state races and such, but our station also had a series uh, with the candidates for appellate judges to get to know them. You know, the ones that are kind of lower in the, uh, the ballot that yeah. you've never heard of. And to me, that was, first of all, obviously, you're not going to see that on a commercial station. What also impressed me was, and I can only speak for my station, is that there were not only Republicans, there were Democrats. It wasn't like watching Fox News where you can, it's like McDonald's. You know what a Big Mac tastes here and in Sweden it tastes the same, doesn't matter. This was going down to positions that really affect the community mm -hmm. at, the, at, at the basic level. And um, to me, that was to me that was just really taught me how important it is. And just let me add one more thing. You know, I've seen over the years, although I haven't been involved in it, the the sort of conglomeration of the big guys, the Sinclairs, the um, others, where decisions are made not in Asheville but are made who knows where. Mm -hmm. Playlists are made who knows where. Um, and and it's really a disconnect. Yeah, it's a, there's a sort of cookie cutter sound to a lot of the, to your point, mm -hmm. um, to, to a lot of the, the material. Um, Adam, you mentioned um, that uh, one of the things you really enjoy about community broadcasting is working with younger journalists, the opportunity it has to 
um, to sort of hone skills in that regard. As your your work here um, at BU as the station manager for both um, the student-run television and radio um, stations, I, I, I wonder um, for those who might be listening as um, recent grads or current students, how do you see community broadcasting playing a role in, in launching careers, you know, and launching the careers of young journalists? Well, I think, um, and Sally referenced this in the, in the first couple of things that, that she mentioned, but one thing that was a value to me when I first started as producer for this show, I was maybe 24 or 25 years old and I didn't have a lot of production experience. But because you have such a skeleton crew, you're forced to be, Peter mentioned this too, you're forced to be super versatile. So just to give you an example of like what what a day in the life would be for me in my first year there when I was in my young 20s and didn't really know what I was doing. I'm I'm um, not in any way a tech whiz either. So to be in a control room for the first few weeks was a little overwhelming. But um, the versatility that I that I gained, you know, made me a better journalist, a better producer, and I think helped me get my next job. So on a typical day, we would do two to three guest segments. I would um, it was always important to me that you're the first face that a lot of people will see at a community station. You may, even though I'm the producer, I'm not the host. When they walk into the building, it's important that they have a good experience, whoever they are, Mayor Wu, um, you know, uh, an artist. So I would welcome them, eventually get them set up behind the desk. And then I'd go back to the control room. I would cue my lead anchor and say like, okay, Chris, here we go. Three, two, one. Then I would run over to the teleprompter, get that started, make sure the host guest uh, mic was on. When the host introduction got towards the end, I would flip the guest mic on. So they both had audio. Then I would go back to the switcher and switch as the interview started. Fortunately, the interviews weren't scripted, so I didn't have to worry about the teleprompter as much, but then I was in director mode. You know, then you shuffle out that guest and bring in the next one. And go from there. Then, then when the show is done in the control room, um, it was my responsibility to edit the whole thing. So I was able to pick up editing skills. So I, I think that's for any young journalist that wants to learn a lot. Frank Shore, who who ran the uh, um, sports program here at BU for a number of years, he started uh, in Massachusetts at a local uh, community station as well, and that's what he loved about it. For any young journalist that really wants hands-on experience. It's a great place to go and to do a lot of stuff and to put a lot of stuff on your resume. So that when you are, when it is time to, to job hunt, um, they can see you have on-air skills, production skills, writing, right. editing, all that stuff. Right. Yeah, Sally, please. Well, I totally agree with everything Adam has just said. And um, my, my uh, observation working in the field is of community radio is that um, there's a phenomenal amount of people who rise to the most senior leadership levels in the public media system through an entry point of a community radio station or a college station. My own story is that my parents helped found the station in my hometown when oh, I was wow. and I got on the radio when I was 16 years old here in Paonia, Colorado. My mom was the first president of the board. The guy who was a station manager wrote a letter of recommendation for me to get into college. My <laughs> principal just saw that 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 um, this would be something that would be um, an independent study I could do based on what I was passionate about, and it's been a lifelong passion. I am still a volunteer DJ. I just did my radio show Monday morning, and I've met lots of people who have those same stories. So when I stepped into after 15 years of managing the local station, the national scene at that time at the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, five out of the top C-suite decision makers had come out of community radio or a college station. So I think of community media as a rookery for talent. You know, it's how people get the bug, they get started, they care about it. And typically if, if you know, I mean, for those people who are audiophiles, it's a lifelong passion because it's how you take information in, it's how you see the world. And I like to tell people that, you know, they think they think of FM as, as, as you know, being translated to frequency modulation, uh, I think of FM as the M stands for magic, and I'm sure you can fill in the blank for the F. <laughs> that is how it works for the people who love it. Yeah, it's it's true. I I, I take pride in the fact that I've um, I have um, sort of crafted a vision of what's possible beyond uh, 
uh, college for a few of my my students brought them over to the audiophile side with my narrative radio class that I teach. So that's always fun when I hear students say, I had no idea I was going to enjoy this. And then after a semester, it is you you catch the catch that bug for um, for a storytelling method and, and way that you see the world, Sally, like you said. Um, I wonder um, any of you can kind of chime in on this one. You know, it's it as a, and and we're we're talking a lot about radio, um, all the community broadcasting. Well, let me I'll hold off on that question because community broadcasting. I mean, it does encompass as Adam has has um, reminded us. It's it's television just as much as it is radio, right? I wonder, Sally, maybe you can start with this since you might have the biggest um, viewpoint from this. Um, but do either one of them have, they're different mediums, right? We often lump them in as just community broadcasting, but they're very different mediums, different storytelling methods, um, different ways to tell stories, right? Um, and to communicate with audiences. Do you see um, either one of them having a stronger foothold than another at this point in time? Or do they complement one another? Do, do their audiences overlap? So the audiences do overlap. Um, and I think circling back around to, you know, Peter's point about the kinds of uh, shows that would never be made were not for, there would never be Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood were it not for public television. It's a similar, a very similar thing. It's, it's stuff that can be done more slowly, stuff that can be done more locally. Um, and so so I think there are some similarities there. In in terms of the, the, the differences and the toeholds, the way I would characterize it is that public Public television has um, its cornerstones tend to be um, early childhood education and our heritage. So his, history, like the Ken Burns stuff, um, that that kind of thing. And then, of course, thankfully, some great British actors <laughs> that, that that public television carries. So I think that's more of the influence. Whereas, where in, when you look at radio, the the influence is is much more. Uh, the cornerstones I would call would be journalism and music discovery. Those two things, both of them share um, real involvement in um, emergency preparedness and response and public safety, like like lots of media. So, um, the other thing that that people might not be aware of is that through the night the Telecommunications Act of 1967, signed by President Johnson, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting was established. And they were established as a nonprofit so that they had a firewall between whatever kind of administration was in control and that in a you know democratic society, there would be those guarantees of a free press, right? So what also happened there is that 75% of the federal investment immediately is directed to TV and 25% to radio. So what's happened in the industry right now is that the, the lines between TV and radio have blurred in this multi-platform environment that we're all living in. And t television has always been more expensive to do, but radio has this super robust audience. So there's a lot going on in terms of how those two, TV and radio, communicate what they share, what they lift up, and how they how they approach that. That's super helpful context. Thank you. Peter or Adam, do you have anything to add about any of Sally's points or follow-ups? You know, what, I just quickly, one thing that is kind of on my mind as we're setting that context is uh, with TV, you know, with community broadcasting in general, you're not going to be on the top of a lot of PR lists in terms of like if the governor is releasing our budget proposal. They, at the time when I was there, she's not going to say, oh, let's talk to BNN first before we talk to some of the outlets or PBS. And um, that was always a challenge for us. But in a good way, I think it's um, radio, TV, they're a little less willing to speak because they have a camera and usually lights in their face. And with radio, you have a little more flexibility, at least with news, that people will be a little more relaxed and uh, a little more willing to speak. And the good thing about if it's difficult when you're in community setting, as we talk about getting your first job, moving on from community, how it works as a training ground. When I left community broadcasting and went to PBS or CNN, wherever it was, I was like, oh, my God, everybody wants to talk to me now. This is easy. You know, I don't have to fight to get. So you can think more about content and who to bring in. And so it was a great learning experience for me in that way. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. Um Peter, anything to add on that point, or should I fire a different question at you? Uh, no, not really. I'm 
I'm not involved with TV and, you know, I'm, I'm really not aware of that, but I do as, um, as um, Adam was saying about it being a community ready, being a training ground, I guess I show my age, but I remember at BU on the BU station, I guess it was TBU, the ones, the community station, um, there was a DJ there called Howard Stern. So <laughs> yes. um, there you go. <laughs> yeah, quite a trajectory. <laughs> um, thank you for reminding us of that, Peter. Um, I, I, we have about five or 10 more minutes um, as the panel uh, sort of, you know, as I guide the panel along, but please start thinking about any questions that you want to um, to add and drop that in the Q&A tab, please. I see um, a couple of those there now. We'll get to them in just a few minutes. Um, one one question about, and, and Sally, you sort of alluded to this, but um, Peter, from your perspective working in Asheville as well, when we talk about the, uh, the financing model for community broadcast stations, um, you know, uh, it's it's the nonprofit organization model, right? You uh, owners, um, listener supported, viewer supported, um, volunteer based supported. Um, some local governments sometimes associated with those, but not always. Is that is that right? Not all, yeah. So um, I guess uh, if from your estimations, maybe I'll start with Peter. What are the pluses and some of the minuses of that model, that financial model, that nonprofit model? Well. Um... I know, you know, we were talking about reaching out. Um, Adam was saying, well, once he was at CNN, there was no problem talking to people. Mm -hmm. I found when I go out for my interviews um, of from my era that I cover, saying that your listener supported actually helps. Because I think a lot of these artists, um, whether they're in England or here, like the sound of that and understand that it's not going to be a dog and pony show. I'm not going to ask about their wild, you know, spring days or, you know, get into anything they would be uncomfortable with, that we'd have a conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and so to me, that's uh, very much a, an advantage. Um, I don't get involved with funding. Uh, that's my station. No, <laughs> no on air fundraising for you. Oh, um, well, I'm also carried by five other stations, so it'd be kind of hard to, you know, do yeah. that in Kansas City, Missouri, for uh, for an Asheville station. But um, we're very lucky in that sense. Um, you know, we don't have to do that a lot, beg for money. Um, we're just we're just lucky to have those kind of resources. But still, um, again, it's it's you own your own shop. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're you're your own small business person. And, you know, after a career in the corporate world, it's it's a real blessing. Yeah. Yeah. There's a certain autonomy to that. Right. Um, and even from my experience working at WBUR, um, I, I felt a great amount of pride and a great amount of independence journalistically. Right. Um, uh, saying that that's the station that I was representing because, you know, we 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 don't we're not beholden to, to advertisers in the same way that some other outlets um, might feel that pressure. Sally, did you want to add something? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's a reason the First Amendment mentions a free press in a democratic society, and that is implies the firewall that there needs to be between the free flow of information and government. So the listener support model is a real is sort of an offshoot of that and something that I think is really important. And also to Peter's point, I think it does it does smooth the way when you approach people about um, your work in media to say that this is listener supported media because uh, faith and trust in commercial media has pretty much tanked and people feel immediately manipulated by it. Um, and that we're, you know, our society is just rife with stories of Rupert Murdoch and, um, you know, the three or four people who own the four, you know, the yeah. major. 
um, commercial media outlets. So, so I think that that that's an advantage. Um, in public media, generally, we say that for every dollar of a federal investment, there's six dollars in private donations and investment that comes in. So, when you think of it in those terms, it's a very successful public-private partnership. You mm -hmm. know, and that federal investment is a lifeline. Without it, you would not have public media. And part of that is because it's very expensive. And as I mentioned, the economic fluctuations across the country, that model starts to break down a little bit. I will say, though, because I just feel compelled to say it to um, students right now, that um, this listener support model is under a lot of pressure over the last 30 years as we as a country have decided to gut the public sector. And so the nonprofit in sector has come forward to provide an increasingly broad uh, set of services for the general public that our nation no longer has the kind of um, uh, agreement that we would provide. So if you're a public radio station, you're competing with people who are literally feeding hungry children, right? And that that's... That is very, very hard. What kind of case do you make? You make the case that you lift up the local nonprofits, that you are a partner to, you know, the the public sector in the kind of coverage and, and the kind of service that you're doing in community. But that only goes so far. So um, I just want everybody to understand that while there are advantages to it, it's really under pressure. And a lot of that is because of the polarization and the lack of any consensus that we have as Americans about what we truly value about our society and in particular our democracy. Mm, yeah, uh, that's, I mean, that's a very poignant um, sentiment to share, Sally. I appreciate that. You know, as you were talking about the historical success of the listener supported, viewer supported model, I can't help but think every time I'm listening to maybe it's um, a podcast by the New York Times or um, especially the New York Times, I suppose, they have their journalists now, right? Um, sort of advertising for, for almost like donations, like donate to the journalism you love to read and listen to, right? That's a line out of public media's book, really, right? Um, and they're, they, they, what does that signal to you in terms of the model for the, the financial model that the commercial industry is, is under when they are almost mimicking that, you know, asking for, for, they don't call it donations, right? They call it, you know, contributions or, or sort of, you know, pay pay for the content, right? But but they have journalists coming on and saying, if you want more stories like this, you know, subscribe to X, Y, and Z. Um, I, I, I'm interested in Sally's take, but Adam or Peter, if you have thoughts on that too. Yeah, so really quickly, I mean, my take and a take of a lot of my colleagues in public radio is that we've done a really excellent job of providing something really meaningful that is well received and people people mimic the model because um, it works and people and those who are listening enjoy it. It's very true in music. I mean, the commercial radio stations, commercial uh, are are tanking big time. And part of that, they've started to do the same kind of AAA mixes as public radio does because it's more palatable to the ear to not be shouted at 24-7 with advertising. And so I think that that um, that's just a message coming through that people are understanding. Uh, another thing that you mentioned podcasts is that, that you know, I think it's kind of unfortunate we call it a podcast because it's audio on demand, it's radio. And then that's what podcasting is. And I think um, so uh, what what a lot of print media has done is to just embrace the multi-platform reality that we're in via podcasting and put that out there. And then of course they have to raise funds for that. But what's disturbing is that bubble has burst. That's why NPR had such a massive multi-million dollar shortfall in their budget because people um, people are tuning into podcasts, although we've kind of hit a wall with that. And then they're not listening to the ads, <laughs> the taglines on the end of the podcast. I mean, right. they're just it's like you're watching TV and you've got to mute. People yeah. are not so it's not necessarily effective. And I think that's a larger problem with advanced monopoly capitalism is that people are so saturated by being marketed from the moment they draw their first breath. And right. that's what we all have to come to terms with. Yeah. So 
Peter, uh, a, a question for you in your market. People are so overly saturated with media where they can access it at their fingertips, their phones, satellite, like radio, et cetera. How do you think or, or why do you think your listeners tune into you? Why do they come back and listen to your show? Well, I've thought about that a lot. <laughs> One of the things I wanted to do when um, I created this show and, and worked with my station manager was I didn't want a wide breadth. I wanted to be very specific in what I was transmitting. So um, as I mentioned before, this is, this is an act of love, right? I'm not paid. Um, this is something I never even dreamed of in the working world and bringing up two kids and, and the whole thing. I chose an era originally, although it's expanded a little bit, of about four years and focused in that um, genre of punk rock. And then I went over to a little bit of new wave. But if you want to hear that kind of music, you know you're going to get it from my show. If you don't like it for whatever reason, then you don't tune in. But I can honestly say I have never found a show that does that, that says, okay, we're going to just focus on this type of music mm -hmm. and put it in context, which is more the, the listener support itself, not only play the music, but put it in context and discuss right. why it's there. And I think people like that. And um, they obviously do. They keep coming back. You're on five stations. Well, yeah, I <laughs> wish I knew them. <laughs> That's fantastic. But, That's fantastic. I think you, it seems like you've dialed into a, uh, to your niche and, and you've got that, that sort of like the people that keep coming back for more, they, they, they know that they're going to get the context and the music that they might not hear elsewhere, that they won't hear elsewhere. Yeah. Exactly. Very well said. Um, yeah. Thank you, Peter. Um, we've got about 10 minutes left. There are a few questions in the Q&A tab. Please keep adding your thoughts there. Um, I'll start with one of the questions. And um, Adam, this might be a good one for you to address and or Sally, but um, Reggie asks, are there current community media stations that pre-college high school programs like Upward Bound can work with to expose students to community broadcasting and to journalism? So um, so any sort of um, programming that's available to, to students before they get into college that could prep them to hit the ground running with the WTBU. Either Sally or Adam can comment on that. Um, I'll just say quickly, actually, Sally, do you have thoughts? And then I'm happy to, to uh, I don't want to jump I mean, in front of you. There are community radio stations all over the country who are knocking themselves out to bring kids into radio stations before college. And um, at our at the station I ran, for example, we we even focused on um, kids tw ten to fourteen years old, to treating teaching them how to do interviews and um, and and dispatching them to cover industries that were quite controversial in our town where like the mining, the, the head of the mining company didn't want to talk to the public radio journalist, but wanted to talk to the child of the coal miner. And, and she did an, an amazing job interviewing. Um, so radio stations are hungry for younger people. It's, it's really not too early to start in community radio stations, small children are on the radio during um, some of the programming and um, it, it can be incredibly empowering for people and also even just a little bit of training for radio sets you up to be able to interview for jobs better to um it's, it's a communication art right so it sets you up in many many ways to succeed and there are all kinds if you go to nfcb.org our organization's website there's a member map and you can hover over the member stations all across this country and if you go to a community radio station i can guarantee you that they're going to want to be part of something um, with youth it's a very big deal to them. That's great. Thanks, Sally. Adam, the second part of this question um, that maybe just you can address in your answer as well is, you know, specifically when we're thinking about students that might um, sort of traditionally be underrepresented 
in journalism or in broadcasting careers? Like how can we sort of um, plant that seed and get them excited earlier? Yeah, I mean, I think um, any cable access station would be a, a great place to start. Um, Boston has one, BNN, Cambridge has one, CCTV. And I think specifically talking about maybe people from differing backgrounds and maybe stories that aren't covered on major outlets. Um, one thing I always try to be mindful of is uh, what are the neighborhoods in Boston that are being underrepresented in terms of not only how often are they touched on by uh, the major outlets, but what stories are being covered when they mention these neighborhoods. So like with Mattapan, Dorchester, Roxbury, a lot of the time it was some crime related story and then they were dismissive and then move on to the next thing. So so what I would love to see from any young journalists, I, I just think in a Boston context, because I've been here for so long, is if you're from a neighborhood like that, try to highlight what you love about your neighborhood. Try to highlight what's special about it. Are there young families there? You know, is there a, a local high school sports team that's doing well? Uh, young artists. We did a story several years ago about... Um, a kid in Dorchester who who was really into bicycles. So he he out of his own garage would um set up his own bike shop where he'd fix bicycles for all the kids in the neighborhood. And we had him on our show and then we sent our videographer out to have him with his neighbors fixing his bike and so whatever, you know, and then then there are also cable access TV when it started, there was no internet and no YouTube. So um that's something they're competing with, but it's also kind of a another potential place where you can practice your skills. So my suggestion would be to start at a cable news station and to pick up some basics and to to tell stories. And then if you want to hone your skills, YouTube is there, um, you know, Spotify is there. A lot of the broadcast tools that we use at professional shops are available to anyone now at home. Um, so there's no reason that if you're interested in being a storyteller to not have um, those tools um, you know, a lot of free tools also. So there's free editing tools, um, recording software. Um, so become your own little, you know, home, set up an own, your own home base if you need to. Um, it's just an, another option. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, Peter, you have something? I just wanted to add something to what Sally said when she, when she said it's never too early to start. I'd like to say that it's never too late to start either. Um, you know, the skills that I learned at Com way back in the 70s are so important to what I do now as far as interviewing, writing, um, and really conceptualizing a story, uh, translating that over to um, a radio show. And... Um, at our station, at least again, I can only speak to our station. We do have young for sure, but we also have people who are older and they bring their own very special take on things. So mm. just wanted to throw one in for the seniors. <laughs> That's a great community to represent um, for our conversation here. Thank you, Peter. Um, we have one other question in the Q&A. Um, and I'm not quite sure I understand it, but I'll put it out to the group. I'm trying to communicate um, with the with the um, attendee here um, to clarify. But the question is, is PR image release too mainstream nowadays? And I'm not quite sure that's resonating for me. Does that resonate for anyone on the panel in terms of, I'm trying to get a few more details from our attendee, but public relations image release to mainstream nowadays. I'm not sure I'm understanding that question. So I'll try to keep communicating with the attendee in the Q&A panel. Sally, did you have an immediate thought? I mean, I saw the question and I'm sorry, I don't understand it either. I, I, I'm i not aware of what PR release is. Okay, yeah, well, I'll try to keep um, honing in on that. We have a, a few more minutes if any of the other attendees want to drop a question into um, the Q and A tab. Um, otherwise, I think uh, kind of a nice one to sort of um, summarize our conversation here about community broadcast in general is I wonder if um, each of you uh, might have a, a brief and just a minute or so um, memory of community broadcasting. Um, you know, maybe a story that aired or an interview with a with an artist or um, 
some sort of uh, result from community broadcasting um, impact in the community or uh, something like that that really stands out to you in terms of memories, um, something extra special, perhaps. Uh, any any thoughts? Anyone want to bite on that one? Sally, Adam, Looks Peter? Like Filmmaker, their favorite movie. <laughs> you go, you go for this one. Um, I am a devotee of StoryCorps, founded by Dave Isay in public radio. It's my favorite thing that happens in our space. And I was able to bring their renovated Airstream van to our town, and we collected 70 oral histories. And you go into the Airstream, you get an hour long conversation. They help you with questions, it's highly supported. And I was able able to interview my father, my son interviewed my mother, um, someone interviewed me, and we have in our family archives now this total treasure of our oral history. And um, and that, that interview of my dad, NPR chose a two-minute snippet for it on Morning Edition one day, and I was literally just washing dishes. And I always listen for the StoryCorps little vignette, and it was me with my dad. And um, so... Yeah, I'll remember that for the rest of my life. It's pretty special. Thank you, Sally. My students have an assignment to create a StoryCorps type submission. So I love that. Go StoryCorps. Adam? I just want to give a quick shout out. I mentioned him earlier, but uh, my, the chief videographer, camera guy, when I was at BNN was a guy named Richard Rosenthal. And he's still at BNN. He's still a cameraman. And uh, he killed me for mentioning his age, but he's he's probably <laughs> close to 80 now. And he just worked so hard and he always had the best intentions and the best attitude. And we would send him all over the city to cover all types of stuff, whether it was, you know, he's in Mattapan in the morning and then had to go to the state house uh, later that day to cover something. And he, he'd hop into the, to the truck and go all over town. And a lot of times he had a one man bandit where he had his camera on his shoulder and he had a, an extension on the microphone and he's <laughs> shouting questions at an interview guest. And he just works so hard. And I think, as Sally mentioned, a lot of these places are skeleton crews. And there's always someone like my guy, Rich, working his butt off to tell stories. And uh, I just wanted to mention him because the relationship that I've developed with him has meant a lot to me. And I know there are a lot of people at stations all over the country that are working as hard as he does to tell whatever stories we have to tell. Yeah, I love that. It's a team effort, for real, um, in the truest sense. Uh, Peter, do you have a uh in the next minute um <laughs> one special memory that comes to mind you want to share sure um so i interviewed a man by the name of steve diggle who is a guitar player original guitar player for a group called the buzzcocks they're a manchester england group you may mm -hmm. have heard of them maybe not and um I decided to go over there just to see them in concert because they were touring. And um, he, he invited myself and my wife back backstage. Mm -hmm. And um, so it was really nice meeting him. It was a, a big thrill for me. But the biggest thrill, the biggest memory was when um, his uh, drummer came up to me and I introduced myself and in about 30 said, seconds okay he said uh steve said your interview was one of the most thoughtful interviews he's ever done oh, so to me so i signed a hundred year contract with the station after that <laughs> it keeps you going it keeps you going thank you so much i want to thank all of our panelists adam peter and sally uh thank you to bu Com for putting this on um, and I know that um, this will be recorded and available um, for you all to, to listen again. That's all we have time for today. Um, but thank you all so much for a great conversation. Have Thanks, a good Shannon. Thank, thank you. Thanks, Thanks Sally. So